So good morning. Sorry about the delay, but some of you who got here early learned why. Because all of a sudden, the sound coming being recorded here came out out of the speakers in the television up there, um, and that was with a kind of a delay. So it was I mean, not quite as lecturing in a cathedral, but. Uh, <laughs> That could be a, a different story. So, <clears throat> and then when the technician is here, that's the time when you're gonna give him some, some feedback on how things are working, right? <laughs> um, so today we're actually getting to what I find is probably the most interesting part of this course or most applicable. Um, you can say what we're doing today is in the linear domain. When I really find it useful is when you go to the nonlinear, but that's the advanced time series course. But basically what we're doing here today is the foundations for what has been done there. Um, so it's about state space models. I remember one of you mentioned state space. Is this just a state space? And I just said yes without discussing it to everyone else. Um, basically, what this is about is that we have a process in X, so the states, where we have a system that is propagated. But most systems, yeah, if you look back at all the models that we have done so far, one of the underlying assumptions is that we observe the system directly with no noise. There's noise in the system, so there's noise propagating the system forward. Here is written in the nonlinear. What we will focus on is where this f of x is just a matrix times x. So that's the linear case. Likewise, from input or exogenous uh, variables, it will just be a matrix times that input. But this is a generic formulation. So we have assumed that we observe x directly. And how likely are we to do that? Let me take the Ming Rus muskrat from last week. What was done there? They looked at how many skins were traded and used that as a proxy for how many animals out there. Well, you don't trade all animals because there will be no animals the next year, right? So it's a measurement where you take a pro proportion of what is out there. So what you observe is some function of your states and then you have some observation noise. Of course, there are cases where the observation noise is very small. Say the import data, maybe you can say that we observe everything there, except for what happens, you can say, persons driving over the border. Um, but you can say, do we actually just observe everything? We observe the state directly. Sometimes you do that. Sometimes you have a lot of uncertainty in the measurement. Because, say, <coughs> what controls the ventilation in here is probably a CO2 sensor placed somewhere. I don't know where it is. But is that representative for the entire room? Maybe. How is the climate control in here? There's a temperature sensor somewhere, but the temperature may differ some degree depending on where you are. So you observe something that you want to use, but effectively the system may be different. It may be more complex as well. So this is to say, this is also a picture of a so-called hidden Markov model. Have anyone heard of HMMs before? So basically, that is saying that if you have a model up here, it's hidden because you don't see it directly. It's Markov because it fulfills a Markov property. Do you know what that means? I think I mentioned it once, but only once. I don't. You may remember. Yes, and it's actually a little bit more particular than what you're just saying. It says that. Oh, was that a? It only on the previous date. So the distribution when you predict forward here does not depend on x n minus one, but only on x n. So it only all the information about the state is 
contained in the current state. So all predictions only depend on the current state, not on any previous observations. That's the mark of prophecy. So whenever you do an AR2 or MA2 model, it is not Markov, unless you formulate it as a vector autoregressive model of order one that we saw last week. So you can rewrite it as a Markov where you just store the previous information by extending the state. So that, that is one of the things in a state space model. You don't have something, you only depend on the previous, as you see here. There's no xt minus two. You have to describe all the dynamics and keep memory of whatever you need to have in memory. So what the goal is, is to say, well, what is the state of the system? And there's one more important part is this observation that you do of your system. You don't have to necessarily estimate everything. You don't have to observe every variable. You just have to serve, observe enough. So if you know how things are in here and you just measure the temperature one place, you can say something about the temperature in the rest of the room, for instance. Now, <clears throat> just examples. Temperature in a room, that's a solid block to say of material. But I mean, you know, if you want to describe it, as we also said earlier on, then you need to do partial differential equations, do a lot of things, but often you just observe one point. You can also have, you can say, if you are trying to navigate a ship, now maybe GPS signals and so on are so precise that you don't have that much uncertainty, but what you do want to have is a good estimate of where you are. And GPS does fail. So a colleague sitting just down the corridor, actually he's employed by a UK company uh, called Sonodyne. They are doing uh, underwater navigation, but they also do that for redundancy. So I don't know how many of you know, remember Deepwater Horizon? In the Gulf of Mexico, there was a, <coughs> a major oil released because of one of the drilling ships. There was an error there, so-called blowout, whatever. What is important is when they're drilling at 2,000 meters of water, it's quite important that the ship, that is, it's not a rig that we use here and around here, but the ship should stay the same place. That's quite important. I don't know if you know that how GPS fails sometime. So if you have a lot of electromagnetic radiation from the sun, so-called solar storms, then that may actually actually turn off the GPS signal. But I mean, that, that's, the, that's the good case when it just turns off. Then you know that you don't know where you are. The bad case is that if you're actually here, but all of a sudden the GPS tells you that you're here and you're drilling, then you have some thrusters and those ships, those ships, they can just be moved in any direction. So they, they'll start shifting it here, but that means you're actually moving out here. All of a sudden, you're not above where you're drilling. <laughs> and you're supposed to stay within 100 meters of where you're drilling. Um, so what they do is that they have some INS, you have, you're all carrying it in your phones as well, where you're measuring accelerations um, and gyro scope, and then you can, based on that, you can estimate of where you're going and wh what you're doing. So they combine that in a common filter that we'll get to in a moment, and then they combine it with <coughs> some measurements of acoustic measurements. So they, they just measure the distance to the seabed, to somewhere. And that's actually, the, they made a, an experiment where they were in a side wind sitting for an hour and a half, and they stayed within a few meters. They turned off the GPS to control the position, and then just tried to do this, and they, can you stay there? And they could. So, but of course, they did a lot of tuning in their filtering. But basically, it's about having a state space that describes the dynamics of what you're looking at. Another case that is typically used um, is so-called PK, PD modeling, pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, describing how drugs are distributed in the body and also how they are acting. <clears throat> 
So whenever you give your eat a pill, whenever you take an injection or something, how does that distribute and how does that react? How are the concentration profiles here, there and everywhere? Now, we all know, I think, that if you want to model the distribution in the body, it's a quite complex system. So you have to do approximations. So that means that your state description up here will be a simple description of what is going on, not the actual system. So that's another thing that can be used. This noise out here can compensate for your lack of your model to actually describe the reality. Now, I don't know how many of you have tried to describe biological processes. I mean, I'm one of them, but whenever you try to do that, you often know that there are things that you have pretty good understanding of, and there's other things that you would like to have more understanding of, and you would want to include it in the model, maybe, if you had more knowledge of it. But you don't know the parameters. You don't know the rates. You don't know what you need to know. So, but that's basically, and, and again, if you do experiments like this, like glucose tolerance test and stuff like that, you don't take blood samples everywhere. You take blood samples in one of the arms. <laughs> so you just have a sample, does not measuring everything everywhere. It's just not infeasible. So basically, what we like to do is, given the knowledge about the physics, and that's where this is also different from the armor processes, because what we did there was basically just to find the model that is best describing what is happening without actually considering that much the physical knowledge. The only place where we did that is for the season. So if we know something about the system, we should try to take one of the major differential equations that we have in there. <coughs> and I don't know how much you've done of that, but if you have an m order differential equation, you can rewrite it as m first order differential equations. Have everyone done that? Anyone not having done it? I will make a small example then at some point. <coughs> but what is also the case is that pretty much every system, at least many of the systems, biological systems, they evolve in continuous time, but you observe them in discrete time. So what we need is a model that works in discrete time. Sometimes it's easier to do things in continuous time, but that's, again, a different course. Um, and that changes the, the parameters. I will show you how that works. <coughs> but you can say, as mentioned before, we'll just consider the linear subspace of state space models. Hello, fellow. <laughs> Water for anyone. <coughs> so I think the easiest case is to say, well, if you have the differential equation, the simplest one we can get up with in continuous time is dx dt equals some constant times x. I think you all solved that one before. So the solution to this one, x is a function of time, and it equals some initial condition and then the exponential of a times t. So that you have all seen before. Now, if I want to go to, to sample this system, how do I get from one time point to the next? One way of looking at it would be to look at xt plus some time step. That brings us to x0 times the exponential of a times t plus delta t. Then we can take this exponential of this sum and split it into two to a product. So we get x0 times the exponential of a times t times the exponential of a times delta t. And then we recognize 
this first bit here is just xt. So this is equal to x of t times the exponential of a times delta t. So effectively, if you want to write this in a discrete time model, what does this correspond to? Well, x at time t plus 1 is equal to some matrix here. Now I will flip the order, doesn't matter. <coughs> I'll write it as an a times xt, where a is equal to the exponential of a times the sampling period. So that's the link from a continuous time process. This is also the reason why I think we discussed this earlier regarding stability of a process. When you are in continuous time, what is the restriction on A for this system here to be stable? Do you recall? Yeah, so the real part has to be non-positive. Actually negative, because if it's zero, then it's just staying where it is. So that is also giving you this restriction here. So if A is negative, real part, it means that if you look at this, it will be at a number less than one in modulus. So that's also where the restriction that we looked at, things should be inside the unit circle, that's also where that restri restriction comes from. It also holds in multivariate setting, except that exponential of the matrix is kind of a different thing, but you do that by a Taylor expansion, and then that works. Then, for just so that we have it for reference, if you have the general second order differential equation, I think uh, I will just, ah, I'll write it nicely, dx square, ah, I'll, do you all know this notation? We just differentiate with respect to time, x double prime equals a times x prime plus bx plus c, that's kind of the generic second order differential equation uh, with constant coefficients. Now, if we introduce y as x prime, then we can take, and instead of looking at just one differential equation here, we can look at a set of two. So we'll have x prime, that's equal to y, and we have y prime, well, that's exactly x double prime. So we can write that as a times y plus bx plus c, right? Now, what I like to do is to write everything in a matrix form. So I will write it. Now I'll probably write it the traditional way, d dt of x, y. We have it a matrix here, and then we have the state x and y, and then we have a vector of constants out there. So let's just take each of the elements and put them, put them where they belong. So x prime equals y. That gives us a 1 and a 0 there, right? Now we take y prime is equal to a times y, so we should have an a there, plus b times x, so we need a b there. And then for the constants, there are no constants for the x prime, but we have a constant for the y prime, so there's a 0 here and a c down there. So that's a general rewriting of a second order differential equation with constant coefficients as a first order 
differential equation of dimension 2. And you can do that for any order. Likewise, you can. it's basically the same thing as we did for taking any armor model and writing it as a vector AR1 model. The only difference, I don't know if you can recognize it, this matrix here, I have the coefficients as a row at the bottom, whereas for the AR part we had coefficients in a column. It's basically the same, it's just a different representations. So it, it, it they just change the meaning of why. But that's a, that's a technical thing, but just to say that it's actually not so different from what we did last week. Yes? Yes. In this case, no, no. In this case, it's just a scalar yeah. per definition. Um, but you can say you could write you, this could be a matrix equation as well. It would work. Everything here would be the same. It, the problem is just the exponential of a matrix. If you look at the definition of it, you have to do numerical calculation to, to do that. So you, in, you effectively you integrate it, or you do a Taylor exp expansion around the point. Um, so it's a numerical thing about the exponential that is uh, the challenge. So to some extent, you can say this actually defines the exponential of a matrix, because you can you can integrate the system forward in time. But I mean, there are numerical methods to do that, but that's a different focus. Uh, so I, I would I mean, this is generic. Either one or n-dimensional. So, what we'll do in discrete time is basically to say we have a system equation for the linear system. Then x t depends on a matrix A times x t minus one plus a matrix B times the input at time t minus one plus some noise. So this is basically the structure that we looked at before, I mean, previously as well. And then we have the observation equation. And sometimes you see where you also, besides having yt equals a matrix times xt plus some noise, you may also have a matrix d times u as the input. But that's a known input. So it depends. Some will have it, some will not have it. Uh, whenever you present state-based models, how generic you want to make them. So I think this is sufficient for what we'll need. And the dimension is called the order of the system. And we assume that these two noise processes, they are mutually independent. That's kind of the usual assumption. But that said, if you have a multivariate system, or if you have a multivariate observation within E1 and E2, there may be correlation structure. It's just that. E1 and E2 are independent. But you may have correlated noise in your system. That's perfectly fine. Now, you have some covariance matrices. That's basically saying that you're allowing those covariance matrices to have thing, elements outside the diagonal if it's multidimensional. And for now, we'll assume that we know all these coefficients. So we'll get back to how to estimate these things, but today we'll assume that we know everything. So we're back to theoretical expressions for how to do predictions and how to do things when everything is known and given. Yes? I think it's better to answer that question next week. But the very brief answer to when you do not model the entire system, yes, then you may have colored noise to some extent. Now, if you have colored noise, that then what, you, what you're supposed to do again, as in, in any other model, is to look at the residuals from the process and see if there's something there that could be improved in the model. So 
this may actually, and that's, it's outside the scope of this course, but it may actually help you looking at this and as another technique as well. Um, but looking at the residuals can help you see that if there's something missing, what is it actually that I'm missing? And, and what I tend to do is actually, if I know that there may be something missing, and I know you can say, where is that related to? Then you can add, not in a linear setting, but in a nonlinear setting, then you can add one of the coefficients in the A matrix, for instance. You can add that as an extra state, and then you can see how does the, this particular state change over time. And then after the fact, you can go back and say that, ah, okay, that state actually depends on another, that parameter depends on a different state. So now I can make an expression here. I can show you many, lots of examples of that, but it's outside the scope of this. So we, I can show you individually, um, but that's part of the course advanced time series analysis, how to do that uh, and helping you to develop a model. Because what we'll get to is that we can use like you ratio to test parameters similar to what we've done, you can see previously. Okay, so this is basically just saying that the Markov process, because all the information about the state is, about the system is contained in the current state of the system. So XT contains all the information that is needed at time T. And you can also handle time varying systems. That's basically saying that these coefficients, matrices here, they have a subscript T and then, but you still assume that they're known at least for now. And that's also in a nonlinear system, basically what, what happens is that these matrices here becomes partial, it becomes uh, Jacobians. So just differentiate your system with respect to the state and then you get the matrix that you need to use. That, that is what's happening in that case. Let's return to an old example, the air pollution case, where we have nitrogen oxide and dioxide as our two states that we observe. And some estimated this model. Now, one of the questions that we had then was, what if we do not observe NO? What do we do then? Well, we still have the state described as the difference from the mean value. And then we have the parameter vectors. We have an A matrix here. That's obvious. We don't have any external input, so B is zero. We have a covariance matrix for the system noise. We don't have any observation noise in this case. We assume that we have served the state directly. That's probably a an approximation, um, but for now, let's just keep it there. And then we say we just observe the second state as the NO2. So we don't observe everything. And I think that's one of the nice things about state space models. You can actually, in some cases, say something about something that you do not observe directly. We'll get back to when you can do this and when you cannot do this. Another typical example, I won't do it with chalk because that makes a lot of noise, is a falling body. I think you all know what happens if I let go of this one, right? What happens? <laughs> yes, at some point it falls to the ground. But you have to assume that you know the initial conditions, right? You had an assumption that was not correct. Let's get back to that in a moment. Um, so you assume a position and you presume, assume an initial velocity. And then you just say, well, ah, we know the physics about this. It's a bit more complex because that sponge is fairly light. So you have to correct for error and blah. But in practice, it's probably a good approximation. So how do we write this? We have two states that we are, are kind of obvious things to handle. We have to deal with the position and the velocity. But the only thing you observe 
typically would be a position that's at least much easier to observe. So one way to observe the position of this one, a very simple way to do that would be to take that camera up there and just look at the frames, right? Then we have a discrete time observation of where that one is. We could do that. We're not going to do it right now, but I think it would be a fairly easy job, right? If anyone of you want to do it, I mean, it could be fun. <laughs> Does it actually follow that equation? Well, that, that, that's another story. Now, in continuous time, well, we pretty much wrote the solution down there. The only non-zero coefficient is that we have C here being a minus G. So we have zero and zero there. And then we have a minus G out there. I will write it, we can write it in many ways, but we have an input here. We could just take it as a minus g is my input, or have g as input and then have a minus one as coefficient. I mean, that's invariant. So this is the system equation in continuous time. And then what we do is that we just observe the state. We don't observe the velocity. So this is the model of a falling body in continuous time description of a state-based model. Now, what I said previously was that we are in discrete time. Now, I think you well, hopefully all remember what the solution is to that. What is the position x of t? That's minus one half times the acceleration. So we should have a oh sorry, minus, I said it wrong. I'll say it's half times the acceleration times the time square. So I will write it as t minus t naught square. And then I will probably just g divided by 2, that's what I want to write. And then what I have to add here is I have the velocity. So I have, and my velocity I will label that as y of t. And the velocity, how far did I move? and then plus my initial position that is x of t0. That's the general solution to that. Yes, did I write something wrong? Yes, that is the speed of t0. Thank you. That is exactly the speed of t0. That's because I wrote something different here. Um, also a little bit different up there because I used instead of x and y, I used x1 and x2. But now I think I will continue in the x, y. So the speed y of t is equal to minus g times the difference in time plus the initial speed. So that's the continuous time description of the system. Now what we want to do is to do this in discrete time. So what we will do is that we'll look at t equals to k times the sampling period and t naught is equal to k minus 1 times the sampling period. So, and then we will look at what happens then. So if we combine these two, what do we then get? If we just write the expression for time t and then pluck, just plug this in, 
we'll see what happens. So we have x at k t equals to minus g half t minus t naught. That's just a uppercase t. That's the sampling period. So that's uppercase t square plus y at time t zero. That's y of parenthesis k minus one times t plus the last bit out here is also the previous state of the system so that x at time k minus one t and then for the velocity y at time k uppercase t equals minus g times the sampling period t plus y of k minus 1 t. Now, if we look at this as a discrete time system, what we want to is effectively to look at using k as our time index. So we can rewrite it as x, y. If you look at the discrete time equivalent of this one up here, we just say at time k. Then we want to look at finding a matrix that we multiply on x, y at time k minus 1 plus an input out here. Let's take our input as in the continuous time description on the previous slide here. Let's make that input something you multiply with g, just to give the similar expression. Now, how do we get from one time to the other? If we look up here, Oh, I forgot to say one thing, I'll write it up here. I'll just right now define the sampling time as a one. I can choose that for whatever, it, it's just going to change the coefficients. But if I do that, and let's just say where each term will end up, minus g half, it is not multiplied by any of the previous states. So it means that I'll get a minus one half g out here. The next one here, that's just y k minus one. So that means I get a one there. This here is x k minus one, which means I get a one there. Now, if we look at the equation for y k, I have a minus g as a constant out here. So I have a minus one there. And then I have it depends on the previous y as well. So I get a 1 there, but it does not depend on the previous x. So the speed or the velocity does not depend on the previous position, only on the previous velocity. That makes a lot of sense. Now, what is the difference between this discrete time and the continuous time equivalent? I forgot to add one thing down here. What we observe is x. So yk equals 1, 0 times xyk plus some observation noise. If we have noise in the system, in the physical experiment, we sometimes assume that that noise is zero. So. This is one of the places where, and this is very typical, when you go from a continuous time description up here, effectively, you only have one parameter, namely the acceleration up there. And you only have two non-zero coefficients. Whereas over here, you have five out of six possible non -zero, uh, the coefficients that are non-zero. Non -zero. 
So it's quite typical that when you go from a discrete uh, continuous time representation to a discrete time representation, you end up having to estimate more parameters. That's one of the reasons why it's sometimes nice to represent the system in continuous time and then given I mean, I could easily, if I change the sampling in here, what would I have to do? I have to multiply with t some places here, right? But that's the only thing that happens. So, in discrete time, you have a more complex, or not more complex, you have more coefficients than you have in continuous time for almost all cases. So sometimes, as just to repeat myself, you want to have a continuous time description of the system, then you translate that to a discrete time system before you do, do your filtering. But again, that we can get back to in a different course. This is basically just what I just did. And the last bit down here is, well, probably also the same thing here, at least if, if I was powerful enough blowing, there would also be some noise up here on the system and I just try to use two different E's here. You will see either written as here, they have E1 and E2, or you would have two different symbols for epsilon, just to indicate it's not the same noise. Another symbol up here, just to show you, would be this epsilon with a small piece on underneath. That's also very different from that one there. That's the kind of thing you typically see, and depending on who is the author, you will see them used differently, but hopefully consistently in any one implementation. So, basically, what is important to do in a real-life experiment is to use this system in order to predict what happens in the future. But also, whenever you get new observations, you want to say, well, what is my current estimate of where I'm at? Because hopefully you learn something by observing something. So you can improve your estimates of where you are, but you can also do what is called interpolation or smoothing. And that's basically saying that if you had observed this falling body, If you then, your uh, assumption was that it did something like this, then you update your estimate, but then after the fact, maybe given that you know everything about what happens later on as well, if you have these observations, you may get a better estimate of what actually was the position here. When you not only rely on previous observations, but also rely on future observations because you can run the filter backwards that we'll get to. We won't focus much on this. It's just I want you to know that it does make sense to look at estimating the p where it is at a given time point, given all observation, both forward and backward in time. But most often what you'll do is you want to run this forward in time. We'll continue that in more detail next week. So, one thing I just mentioned is that we do not have to observe every single state, but there is a restriction, and that's called observability. So, given a system here, then you look at the rank of this matrix here. So, what you have is, you have the transpose of C, then you have C times A transpose, and then you continue doing that up to the dimension of the state minus one. So in this case here, m equals two. So we have to look at what is c transpose and c times a transpose. So c transpose is the easy one. What do we get? So we want to make the matrix of C transpose, and then we have C times A transpose. 
that's what we want to calculate. So what we get, C, we have that there, we transpose that and get a 1, 0. Then C times A, C is a 1, 0, and A is a 1, 1, 0, 1. So what I get is, I get a 1 by a 1, a 0 by a 0, so that gives me a 1, and then I get a 1 by a 1, and a 1 by a 0, so I get the result is 1, 1. And when I, do you all follow me doing this linear algebra in this way? Hopefully, otherwise, take it later. So I have a 1, 1 column there. What is the rank of this? It's 2. It's an easy one because you have zeros below the diagonal. So in this case, the rank of that matrix is equal to the dimension. That means we have fulfilled the requirement of observability. And just one way to get a rank is to say, to do some kind of decomposition here, the QR, uh, but just as a method to get the rank. <laughs> you can do that in other ways, but in this case, you don't have to do the math, you can just look at it, right? Um, but sometimes life will be more complicated. I think just displaying the definition of the Kamen filter that's what I've been warming up to, and I've been also mentioning it quite a few times. That's the good place and time to have a break. So let's resume a couple of minutes past nine. <laughs>